two bare-chested brawlers stage a scintillating showdown. A daring inmate makes a death-defying escape, and an iconic magician's secrets revealed. But first, a shadowy web of secrets and lies unravels at the most iconic palace on Earth. Situated 10 miles southwest of central Paris is one of France's largest and most extravagant castles, the Chateau de Versailles. This monumental palace is bigger and grander than any other palace ever. This royal residence was opened in 1682, and its regal facade has become synonymous with refinement and elegance. There is gilding at the rooftops and sculptural elements between every one of the windows. The grounds of the estate are larger than the island of Manhattan and feature more than 225 acres of immaculately manicured gardens. Inside, over 2,000 rooms overwhelm visitors with lavish displays of art, sculpture, and ornamentation. Its breathtaking showpiece is the Gallery des Glaces, a magnificent hall lined with over 350 mirrors. It's opulence on top of opulence. This extravagant palace is renowned for its decadence. But its splendor belies a notorious past of greed, deception, and theft. This was an event so shocking that it changed France forever. Cardinal Louis Rohan is one of the wealthiest men in France and dutifully serves as a financial advisor to King Louis XVI. But the ambitious clergyman lusts for greater influence. Even though he already has wealth and power and stats, he just wants more. But he feels one person is holding him back. The queen, Marie Antoinette. He's convinced that Marie Antoinette is telling Louis, I don't like him, don't give him anything. The cardinal's greatest ambition was to really get in Marie Antoinette's good graces. In March, he finally gets his chance. One night, Rohan is introduced to a beautiful young countess named Jeanne de Lamotte. She tells him that Marie Antoinette is actually a really good friend of hers, and she sees her all the time at Versailles. The Cardinal pleads with the Countess to appeal to the Queen on his behalf. Eventually, his efforts pay off. Jeanne promises she's going to arrange a rendezvous with the Queen at midnight in the gardens at Versailles. The Cardinal is overjoyed. On the night of the meeting, Rohan finds the veiled monarch waiting for him in the moonlight, just as Jean promised. Then she hands him a rose. The cardinal is thrilled by the warm reception. He throws himself at her feet and says, I'm going to cherish this rose forever. Not long after, the countess brings the cardinal a message, which she says is from Marie Antoinette. It seems that to prove his new loyalty, the queen has a very special request. She'd like Rohan to help her buy a necklace, and she knows just the one she wants. It is the most gaudy thing you can imagine. It is huge. 647 diamonds, 2,800 carats, give or take. The necklace is so big, the red leather case that contains it is the size of a serving flat. The opulent baubles come with a royal price tag. In today's math, it would be roughly about $25.5 million. The letter claims that if members of the public saw Marie Antoinette purchase the expensive piece, it would spark uproar. She's known for her extravagance, and she's already in trouble for being in debt all the time. So the message proposes that Rohan visit the jewelers on her behalf. All he needs to do is arrange for her to pay for the necklace and installments and sign as the guarantor. And Jean will be the intermediary and collect the necklace and bring it to Marie Antoinette. The power-hungry cardinal is more than happy to help. So he does as he's told and collects the necklace, then gives it to Jean. The cardinal is delighted. This is his chance to really get in Marie Antoinette's good graces. But little does he know that he's been roped into one of the biggest scandals of all time. In August, Rohan is confronted by the queen and king at Versailles. Marie Antoinette has just been visited by the jewelers. They wanted to know why she hasn't paid them back for the necklace. But the queen's response shocked them all. She's like, what necklace, what purchase? Marie Antoinette didn't know any of this was going on. In confusion, the group slowly pieces together what really happened. It seems the countess is not who she claimed to be. 
Instead, she is nothing more than a money-hungry swindler. She was the greatest con artist of the 18th century. Sensing the ambitious cleric would be easy prey, Jean conspired to play him for cash. So, she pretended to be friends with the queen, though they had never met. Then, she orchestrated a fake meeting at Versailles with a lookalike she hired, who was actually a prostitute. Finally, Jean made her big play, a forged request for the diamond necklace. The cardinal fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And he realizes, I've been a gullible fool all this time. Soon after, the thieving countess is arrested. But it's too late. The elaborate necklace has been broken into pieces and sold on the black market. Found guilty at trial, she is sentenced to life in prison. The scandal forever damages Cardinal Rohan's relationship with the royal family, and he is forced to live in exile. But the incredible caper has one other unexpected consequence. The queen's reputation as a spendthrift is so pronounced that the public becomes convinced she actually did purchase the necklace. People didn't like her to begin with, so what happened was that the absolutely innocent victim, Marie Antoinette, becomes the villainess. The affair of the necklace becomes a rallying cry. But just four years later, the public rises up against the monarchy in the French Revolution. Today, Versailles is remembered as the lavish home of the French monarchy and the center of a regime that was ultimately brought down by its own greed. A bitter feud between two hot-headed socialites leads to a risque standoff. This body battle goes back to this immaculate domain. Two hours west of Prague is the idyllic Czech town of Marianske Lasne. Once a tranquil spot town for noble statesmen, it features celestial fountains and exquisite architecture. Just outside the splendid haven is a massive palatial retreat, Kinsvart Castle. Kinsvart is grand and sophisticated. It's a beautiful, beautiful castle. Built in the 17th century, the mansion perfectly complements its genteel setting. It's surrounded by lush green countryside. And at the heart of the building is this stunning courtyard. The interior is just as entrancing. The rooms are so grand, you can just imagine how wealthy these people were. The most remarkable part of the home is the Chancellor's Library. It's known all over Europe for its amazing collection of books. It really is an amazing thing to see. This graceful palace is the epitome of refinement, but its residents weren't always so angelic. This noble and stately home was linked to one of the most shocking jewels of all time. Princess Pauline Menenik is a strong-willed socialite who thrives on hosting events for the city's elite. Accustomed to luxury, her family owns numerous homes, including the stunning Kinsvart Castle. Princess Pauline Metternich was an infamous character. She was tenacious and determined, and she looked to be the center of attention. So, when she learns a massive arts exhibition is coming to town, she sets her sights on running the show. The princess is confident it will cement her status as Queen of Vienna's social scene. She knew what she wanted, and she knew all the right people. So, she became the honorary president of the exhibition. But another society lady also wants to make her mark. Pauline's rival, Countess Anastasia Kilmansegg. Countess Kilmansegg was very much like Princess Pauline. She was determined to succeed, throwing herself into any social event. The Countess secures a position on the exhibition committee, right alongside the headstrong princess. And from the start, there's trouble. It's no great surprise that when the two ladies started working together, that of course the sparks would fly. Soon, the bickering becomes unbearable, and the women have a huge falling out, allegedly over a flower arrangement. They'd like to think that two ladies would be able to argue in a civilized manner, but they couldn't. They did not like to be told what to do. So, they take drastic measures. This argument was deemed so serious that there was really only one way to resolve it. A duel. On the morning of the showdown, the two debutantes choose swords as the weapon of choice. Abiding by French rules, once one of them is wounded, the matter is resolved. 
it goes without saying that a jewel isn't exactly safe, so the ladies selected a medic to be on hand, and the medic herself was a lady. But before the floral nemeses engage, the doctor draws their attention to a potentially fatal hazard. She was concerned that if a bit of clothing became driven into the wound, it could become infected and therefore septic. So, as the story goes, to avoid mortal injury, the doctor makes a brazen suggestion. The adversaries should fight topless. This must have been one of the most sensational medical interventions ever made. It's 1891 in Vienna. When event preparations turn sour, Princess Pauline Medinek challenges fellow socialite Anastasia Kielmansek to a duel. But due to the risk of clothing entering a wound and becoming infected, a doctor proposes an unconventional solution. The two women should fight topless. The high society women are stunned by the suggestion. It was unusual that they had even taken the step of having a duel, but to then carry this duel out whilst exposing themselves, it must have shocked both ladies to the core. But in the interest of safety, they agree and remove their blouses. These are two ladies who wanted to win this argument, so topless or not, they were still fighting to the blood. The duel commences, and the bare-chested contenders boldly swing their rapiers, knowing that any strike is sure to pierce their bare skin. A fiery war raged between the two ladies for supremacy. Until the princess takes a serious cut on the nose and swiftly counters with a blow to the countess's arm. Finally, the doctor stepped in and begged the ladies to stop the madness. The wounded aristocrats slowly regain their composure, and Pauline finally makes peace with Anastasia. Once the duel was over, there actually was a happy ending. In the weeks following the skirmish, the two women worked side by side and peacefully finished planning the exhibition. Despite all the drama, it was a roaring success. Thankfully, there was no more fighting to the blood. But while most duels go unreported, this contest becomes international news. It's really no wonder that this made headlines around the world. Two bare-chested, high-society ladies armed with rapiers. Who couldn't be fascinated by that? Today, Kingsvard Castle stands as a reminder of the illustrious Menenek family and the fiery female duel between two saucy socialites. An imprisoned general makes a death-defying bid for freedom at this massive citadel. <laughs> Konigstein, Germany, sits in a region called Saxon, Switzerland, due to its picturesque forests and mountains that resemble the Swiss countryside. But within this bucolic riverside town is a hulking man-made structure, Konigstein Fortress. Konigstein Fortress is extremely imposing. It's described by some as an eagle's nest due to its construction high above the hilltops. Originally the site of a 13th century palace, it was later converted into a defensive stronghold. Surrounding the complex is a 2.2 kilometer wall, which just shows how secure this location is. But these sandstone walls did more than keep invaders out. They also kept prisoners in. But one inmate would stop at nothing to flee this frightening compound. This was the site of one of the most daring and courageous escape attempts ever known. In the wake of the Nazi Blitzkrieg, the Allied forces of World War II are in retreat. Thousands of soldiers are captured and sent to prisoner of war camps in Germany. One such facility lies within the impregnable Konigstein Fortress. It had been used as a prison many, many times before, and no one had managed to escape. But one captive is determined to change that. 61-year-old French general Henri Giraud. When Giraud was brought to Königstein Fortress, immediately he thought, I'm not staying here, I am going to escape. The guards allow officers to move freely around the complex. So Giraud uses this opportunity to survey Königstein for a way out. There was a drawbridge, but that was heavily protected by armed sentries. In addition, the fort's height prohibits the possibility of digging a tunnel. So he concludes his lone way out is to somehow descend the fortress's 131-foot perimeter wall. But since it's a near-vertical drop, it seems his only option is to rappel down the sheer rock face. That's an extreme risk for anyone to take. 
and this is a man in his early 60s. And if he manages to get out of the fortress, he'll still face an arduous journey to neutral territory. If anything was to go wrong, surely he would meet certain death. But Giroux is determined to regain his freedom. So for almost two years, with the help of other prisoners, he surreptitiously acquires the items he'll need to break out. A rope and small wood seat for repelling, and civilian clothes to disguise himself once outside the fortress. By April 17, 1942, everything is in place, and he decides it's time to make his move. At around 10 a.m., just after morning roll call, Giraud found a spot away from the guards that he thought he had the best chance of escape. He recruited the help of some fellow officers who tied the rope to the railings. Giraud quickly hoists himself over the guardrail. Then, the other men carefully begin lowering him towards the ground, over 130 feet below. His progress is steady, though slow. And the general knows that every second spent dangling in midair is fraught with risk. The stakes could not be higher. But after what feels like an eternity, Giroux reaches the bottom. Finally, his feet touch the ground. He made it over the wall. With the first hurdle behind him, he changes into the smuggled civilian clothing. Then he runs. It seems he's that close to being a free man. But unbeknownst to Giroux, back at the fortress, his absence has been noticed. The guards went to his room and found a map planning Giroux's apparent escape route. It looked like the game was up for Giroux. It's 1942 in Germany, when French POW Henri Giroux repels down the walls of Konigstein Fortress. It seems that freedom is in his grasp. But back at the prison, officials have made a potentially disastrous discovery. A map detailing Giroux's route to neutral territory. The map indicates the general plans to enter Switzerland via the border town of Schaffhausen. It seems he had made one crucial error, because of course now the guards knew where to find him. Following this lead, the Nazis launch an extensive manhunt. They publicize the fugitive's route and offer a huge reward for his capture, dead or alive. But little do they know, the map is part of the general's grand plan. This was a red herring, a fake. It was deliberately left by Giroux. It wasn't his route at all. It was just something to send them off on the wrong path. With the Nazis fooled by this misdirection, Giroux stealthily makes his way to an area roughly 100 miles west of Schaffhausen. On April 22nd, he reaches his destination. He finally managed to get into neutral Switzerland, where he was safe at last. But the tireless hero doesn't rest for long. Giroux returned to the war effort, where he commanded troops in North Africa. He even lived to see the Allies victorious over the Germans. Today, Konigstein Fortress remains a silent witness to one man's bravery in the face of daunting odds. A struggling entertainer, a death-defying stunt, and a tantalizing secret all come together at this idyllic California estate. The bustling metropolis of Los Angeles has long been the stylish home for some of the world's biggest celebrities. But tucked away in the Hollywood Hills is one sheltered manor that appears as if by magic. The house itself is in this little hill and there's rolling terraces and gardens. It's very green and lush. Built in the early 1900s, this mansion lies on a quiet five-acre estate. The secluded grounds are shrouded in intrigue, offering caves, exotic plants, and a stone waterfall. The property is full of surprises. There's all sorts of little pathways and hidden gems. Inside, the manor's enchanting rooms feature antique brass chandeliers and hand-carved wood furnishings. The structure has a Mediterranean feel and a very 1920s vibe. These secretive grounds are a fitting residence for the world's most mysterious entertainer, a man who captivated crowds with a very dangerous stunt. Not only was his career at stake, but his life was at stake. Entertaining patrons in the city's rowdy taverns 
is a 25-year-old magician struggling to make a living. His name is Harry Houdini. Highly ambitious, he dreams of performing in more prestigious settings. He wanted money, he wanted fame, and he wanted to be adored. One day, Houdini's unwavering determination finally pays off. After dazzling a drunken crowd with a signature handcuff escape trick, he catches the eye of a vaudeville impresario. In Houdini's day, performing at the theater level for vaudeville, that was the top. But there's a problem. He will now be performing across the country for more discerning and sober audiences. Houdini knows his current stable of card tricks and handcuff escapes isn't going to cut it. But he has to develop new and better things. It wasn't enough to do great magic. You had to put your life on the line. So the clever illusionist begins developing a show-stopping trick that he believes will set him apart. On opening night of his new tour, the theater is full as Houdini takes the stage. Toward the end of his routine, the crowd watches as he pulls out two ordinary items, a packet of needles and a length of thread. These are things every woman would have had in her sewing kit at home. He calls a spectator to the stage and has him inspect the needles. Houdini then has the audience member examine his mouth to confirm that it is empty. When the individual is satisfied, Houdini places the needles on his tongue, takes a drink from a big glass of water, and swallows. It has a visceral reaction. People look away. But Houdini is not done. As the audience watches in amazement, he repeats the process with a ball of thread. All of a sudden, the illusionist begins to writhe in pain and heave violently. The crowd can hardly believe their eyes at what happens next. He reached into his mouth and one by one by one, the needles would be threaded on the string. The audience is stunned. Word quickly spreads about the amazing new magician and his incredible needle trick. And there wasn't another act anything like this, and people started to remember the great Houdini. Before long, his name becomes synonymous with unthinkable escapes, vanishing acts, and death-defying stunts. In 1919, at the peak of his success, the entertainer settles here at this estate in the Hollywood Hills. But even as his fame grows, Houdini never abandons the trick that first stole the show. Throughout his career, Houdini would always rely on the needle trick. Audiences desperately want to know how he pulls off the stunt without hurting himself. But with Houdini's untimely death in 1926, it seems like they may never know. That is, until a mysterious associate comes forward to blow the lid off the magician's most closely guarded secrets. It's 1930. Three years after the death of Harry Houdini, it seems the secrets behind his fiercely protected illusions are about to be exposed. A man named R.D. Adams, who claimed to be a confidant of Houdini, a stagehand to Houdini, published a tell-all account of some of his most popular illusions, including the needles trick. The magician's secret, it seems, was having a second set of needles. This decoy was pre-threaded and concealed at the start of the trick. He said that Houdini was hiding the needles in his mouth. hundred needles. The article alleges that the threaded needles were in place even as the audience member did his inspection. The key to hiding this extra set was placing it behind his fingers. Then, he merely pretended to swallow the unthreaded needles that he initially displayed. After that, all it took was a bit of theatrics to sell the trick before he reached into his mouth and slowly pulled out the pre-threaded needles. In the article's aftermath, some allege R.D. Adams did not have the insider knowledge he said he possessed, and that Houdini's secret died with him. People who worked with Houdini claimed they had never heard of R.D. Adams. Whatever the truth, the great magician's legacy endures. Today, the Houdini estate stands as a testament to an incredible career built with the help of several sharp needles, some thread, and a lot of showmanship. A king's mysterious illness leads to a vicious power grab that threatens a nation. But this elegant retreat may hold the cure. London, England was once known as the Big Smoke for its debilitating smog. But just outside the city is a graceful estate that's a breath of fresh air. This is Kew Palace. 
There's a quiet grandeur to the palace, a sort of isolated splendor. It's somehow tucked away, but at the same time very imposing. Built in 1631, this regal refuge is situated within the verdant bounds of the Royal Botanic Gardens. It's a place of relative solitude and seclusion. The red brick exterior exudes an understated elegance, while inside, the cozy mansion is fit for royalty. The Queen's drawing room is incredibly striking. It has pink walls and then scarlet furniture. But once, these tranquil surroundings did little to stifle the ravings of a king in the throes of lunacy. This is the story of how a mad monarch's illness threatened to plunge Britain into crisis. King George III is the beloved sovereign of the United Kingdom. He has steadfastly led his country for almost 30 years. George III was pragmatic, he was sensible and quite cautious. He is absolutely central to the running of government. But in October, the ruler suddenly falls ill with severe fever, headaches and abdominal pains. Very quickly, this deteriorated into long ramblings, sort of fits, unable to sleep, unable to shut up. No one really knew the cause, but George the King had gone mad. Alarmed, the King's family ushers him to a calmer environment in the hopes it will help quiet his mind. His childhood home, Kew Palace. This was seen as the ideal place where he could recover in solitude and regain control of his apparent fitful emotions. But as the king's condition worsens, it seems the respite isn't working. At one point, he didn't recognize his wife. Soon after, members of parliament come to a bleak conclusion. A regent is needed to rule in the king's place. In line for the position is George's son, the 26-year-old Prince of Wales. But there's a problem. The Prince of Wales is a party animal. He had numerous women and was in debt to pretty much everyone. To make matters worse, the playboy prince has long coveted his father's throne. The Prince of Wales regarded this as a huge opportunity. He wasn't interested in politics particularly, but he was interested in power, in wealth, in the status, all that came with it. But the public is horrified by the thought of such a leader. They fear the damage he might inflict on the country's finances and reputation. Uncertainty and really impending crisis grip the nation. It's 1788 in London, after King George III mysteriously goes mad. His son, the reckless Prince of Wales, strives to take the throne. But if he succeeds, many fear he will ruin the nation. So the King's supporters vow to stop the brash heir, no matter what. In a bold move, they call upon an aging doctor named Francis Willis who is said to have practiced medicine without a license. He had been in charge of a lunatic asylum, and he had quite erratic and odd methods. As he begins treating the king, his techniques turn heads. He really saw that his role was to try and control the king. So he had a mix of kind of carrot and stick approaches. He would let the king play backgammon and read Shakespeare. But at other times, he would basically tie the king in bed, put him in a straitjacket, the most extreme methods. For more than two months, the doctor attempts to drive the madness from the king's mind to no avail. It seems like there's nothing the sovereign supporters can do to stop the prince's takeover. This was the worst possible scenario for George's realm. But finally, Dr. Willis's unconventional approach seems to work. And just in time. Literally a couple of days before the Prince of Wales was going to become regent, the king started to talk lucidly. The relieved public rejoices. For saving the kingdom from disaster, Dr. Willis is hailed as a national hero. With his health restored, George III rules for another two decades. Today, it's believed King George suffered from a rare blood disease or a psychiatric condition such as bipolar disorder. Whether it was actually Willis's methods that caused him to improve remains a matter of debate. But Kew Palace still stands as a testament to a bout of insanity that drove a country mad. Life, death, and a 
celebrity scientist. The search for answers begins at this tropical estate. Fort Myers, Florida, earned the nickname the City of Palms for its flourishing urban greenery. It's a fitting location for a tranquil riverside retreat called Seminole Lodge. Seminole Lodge is a beautiful, serene structure. It really gives you a sense of a getaway. Set on 20 acres, this pristine manor is engulfed by exotic flora. It's got plants and trees here from just about every continent. Thousands of different varieties and all. Underneath the red cedar roof, the rooms contain unique touches to bring nature inside. There are French doors that allow river breezes to flow right through the home. But this airy mansion wasn't merely a winter sanctuary. It also served as a workspace for one of America's most prolific inventors, Thomas Edison. With insight he gained here, he may have conducted his strangest experiment ever with subjects from beyond the grave. If anyone could scientifically prove that there was an afterlife, it was Thomas Edison. America is in the grips of an extraordinary phenomenon, spiritualism. This mystical practice preaches a belief in the afterlife and communication with the dead through a medium. In the wake of World War I, it's a tantalizing premise. Many Americans had lost loved ones and they were clamoring for a way to recover some part of that connection. But so far, there's no proof that the afterlife exists, let alone that spirits can speak to the living, and the public is desperate for clues. They really wanted answers to some of life's deepest questions. So the nation is thrilled when one of the country's preeminent scientific minds enters the debate, Thomas Edison. Edison is generally regarded as an American icon, and he was a very curious individual. The burning questions raised by spiritualism have caught his attention, and he's pondered life and death at length at his Fort Myers estate, Seminole Lodge. In October, he speaks to a reporter from American Magazine and makes a bold statement. He said that he believed it possible to construct a device that would communicate with the spirits of those who have passed on. If he's right, it could prove once and for all that the afterlife is real. Then, he drops another bombshell. He's already building just such a machine. When the article is published, it causes a firestorm. The reaction from the public is tremendous. The magazine immediately receives somewhere around 600 letters. Readers' responses range from exuberant support to grave concern that the apparatus might channel evil forces. But they're confident that if anyone could build such a device, surely it's the brilliant Edison. The nation anxiously waits the mysterious machine. The prolific creator, however, never delivers. In 1931, Edison passes away, and no such device was ever found. The public was immensely disappointed. Rumors swirl that the machine was in fact lost or destroyed following his death. Or perhaps Edison, a known prankster with the press, never truly cared about the topic to begin with. But in 1933, a new twist to the story emerges. An article comes out in Modern Mechanics magazine that claims that Edison's device to communicate with spirits existed. Could this finally provide the answers to the eternal question, is there life after death? It's 1933. Two years after Thomas Edison's death, a new article in Modern Mechanics magazine makes a shocking claim that the prolific inventor did indeed build a device to communicate with the dead. The article details that in 1920, Edison created a prototype that shot a thin, constant beam of electrical current to a receiver that measured it on a meter. Any interruption in the meter's level would be evidence of a spirit's presence. What's more, he even put the apparatus to the test at a seance. The article states that on a black, howling, wintry night, Thomas Edison brought together a group of spiritualists and scientists to use his device to communicate with spirits. For hours, the mediums attempted to summon the dead, while the scientists monitored the delicate instrument. But the meter never moved. It was steady as a rock. The machine was a failure. According to the article, for this reason, Edison's invention was never shared with the world. Though Edison never cracked his otherworldly dilemma, for some, this article is irrefutable proof of his intent. But others aren't so sure. The article doesn't attribute an author 
and there was no one who was present at the seance listed by name. While the true nature of Edison's efforts to contact the spirit world remain a mystery, today, Seminole Lodge serves as a sterling reminder that the secrets of death are eternally alluring.